Welcome to Assembly Calendar. I'm Mike Friesan, and with us for our program today, Assemblyman Jim Tedisco. Jim Tedisco represents the 112th Assembly District, an assembly district that includes Schenectady and Saratoga counties. We thank you folks uh, for joining us for our program today all throughout the Capital District. Jim Tedisco, nice to see you. It's good to see you. It's back, our, uh, back at it. Back at it again. It's our first chance to sit down and chat since the uh, legislature finished up work on the 2015-16 state budget. Uh, I mean, before we got, we're going to spend most of our time today talking about the education portion of the budget and the funding for schools, as well as the Common Core, which is all the headlines right now. But before we do that, anything uh, about this budget uh, for the people watching that you represent? Are they going to be happy with this for the most part, or is there going to be some problems? Do you think? Well, I can tell them as the representative, I'm not happy with this particular budget. You know, there's always two parts of a budget. There's the process leading up to the budget and how you get to the place where you're at. Now this budget was an expenditure of all state monies, just state monies of $142 billion. All funds money, including federal dollars, $150 billion. Now, I'll concede one thing, that the positive aspect of this is we stayed within the realm of inflation in terms of spending. Sometimes I think that we should not just stay in the realm of inflation in terms of spending, but kind of maybe stay flat or reduce uh, spending sometimes, uh, just like we'd like to see uh, our constituents' property taxes stay flat or reduced because they're the highest property tax. Uh, not property tax owners only, middle class property tax owners, anybody who owns uh, a property in the state of New York. But when you look at the process itself, I think this is the worst process I've seen in terms of transparency. There's 12 budget bills, and I don't, we won't go into the fact now about the fact that uh, on November of last year, our constituents said, we like that idea, Jim Tedisco, Proposition 2, to go digital, get all that paper off your desks, be more effective, more efficient, save millions of dollars, and keep ink-filled sheets and reams of paper, tons of paper, out of landfills. Well, when we did this budget, and we're still in the process, it's five months right now, the 10, no, 12 largest bills that we will do this year are budget bills. Piles and piles, and I think you have some video oh, of that. You'll see them. We'll, we'll see those bills <laughs> later on we'll in We'll see program. some of those bills. Tens of thousands of dollars were expended, the point I'm trying to make, just to do those, print those 12 budget bills, when we could have done what our constituents asked us to do, move into the 21st century, remove all the paper. Many states have done it. I shepherded it through the legislature. But more onerous than that, eight out of those 12 budget bills were put on our desk with what's called a message of necessity. Now, for the constituents watching, they've probably heard this, for those in the capital region, who have some kind of understanding of what a message of necessity is. It's something the governor sends us. When our founding fathers said, look, these budgets and these bills, all bills, should age on a representative desk for three days. Because we're representatives, we should read the bills. We should have at least three days to read the bills. Message of necessity says, in an emergency, a terrorist attack, uh, Sandy, a storm, coming, a, a financial emergency, we can bypass that, short circuit it with a message from the governor of necessity passed by a majority of the Senate and the Assembly, both houses, both sides, 76 votes. We had eight messages of necessity on 12 budget bills. None of those were emergencies. We didn't have an emergency with doing a, a budget bill. So they were in the middle of the night, two, three, or four o'clock in the morning. Now, first of all, when you work two, three, or four o'clock in the morning, I mean, uh, armies do that, provide sleep deprivation to confuse their enemies. We shouldn't be enemies with the governor. He should have the media there. He should have the public there. If it was so good to do budget bills in the middle of the night at 2, 3, or 4 o'clock, why doesn't the governor and the leaders have their press conferences at 2, 3, or 4 o'clock in the morning? They have them at 10 a.m., 10.30, where the sun is shining, the media is there. This is my idea. I want the public to see it. Well, that tells you something. If you want to work in the middle of the night with emergency messages of necessity when there's no emergencies, you can't be too proud of your budget bills. So the process itself was severely flawed, very disheartening, and as Bob Woodward said from uh, Watergate fame, uh, democracy in darkness dies, or in darkness, democracy dies. And I think democracy died a little bit. So that part of it was disconcerting. I mentioned uh, all the headlines uh, the past week or so across New York State have had to do with the Common Core and the round, the, the recent round of standardized testing, and how so many parents 
have opted their kids out of that testing. We're, it's, uh, we're starting to hear more about it. We're starting to see the groundswell of attention that's being paid to this particular issue. And this was an issue that was a big part of this budget process, which might sound unusual because it's education policy we're talking about, but the governor did that. He tied the Common Core and the standardized testing and the teacher evaluations into this document. In fact, he even tied the amount of state aid that would end up going to school districts to what the legislature did with regards to passing uh, all this standardized testing. I, you had some issues with that. Let's show a brief clip of you talking about that, and then we'll talk more about the Common Core and what's going on with it here at the state capitol with Jim Tedisco. This is your classic end around. This is a majority that doesn't want to take responsibility for not protecting our kids, our educational system, or our educators. What's going to happen here is the governor is going to get his way. He's going to have a commissioner which listens to exactly what he has to say, whoever he or she is, because the governor will be putting that commissioner in place. And the fact of the matter is that commissioner is going to utilize every single thing that you're going to go back to your constituents and educators say, well, we rejected that. You didn't reject it. You gave it to a single unilateral person who's going to put in place an overutilization of standardized tests which are hurting our kids because they're not developmentally appropriate. Raise your hand if you're an educator in this room, because I had a real job at one time. For 10 years, I taught kids. I was an educator. I taught kids with learning disabilities. I got a degree in special education. I'm very proud of that. Difficult job, tough job, but the most rewarding job in the world. And you know what? I never was concerned about standardized tests. I wanted them to do well on standardized tests, but I knew that there was a whole group of measures that they were going to be evaluated on. Not a teacher who was going to be evaluated on by 50% of a test that has 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th grade comprehensive questions for 3rd and 4th graders. That's what you're getting right now. We well, did promise that we would show you the budget bills, and that was the stack, and that wasn't even all of them. That oh, was no. just a couple of them. Yeah, that was tons of paper, reams of paper, bucket loads of paper, so tens I think, of thousands of dollars. I think the point you make there that's interesting is that the these tests that the kids are being that are being put in front of the kids for them to take aren't right now even having much of anything to do with them learning. Mm -hmm. It's all about evaluating the teachers. That seems really when you when you think about it it seems rather contradictory to well, the process. The point I was trying to make there tests are not utilized standardized tests to stigmatize kids or teachers and I see the governor has a disagreement he didn't even go, did get endorsed by the teachers union last year but he shouldn't take it out on the kids and the parents and the families and that's exactly what he's doing look this common core and as you know I put forth this which is the common core parental refusal act 40 sponsors in the New York State Assembly nine sponsors in the Senate both sides of the aisle the chairwoman chairwoman Nolan uh, after I debated on the floor and said uh, well we don't need to inform parents that they have the right to refuse and there are no penalties for kids or schools or educators if they do refuse well in two days later I don't know if you know this or not we haven't discussed this she put her in her own bill which is almost identical to my bill which was been in place for about seven weeks right now because she knows it is the case very cynical towards what we're trying to do here and what they were doing on the floor I alluded to is also cynical they punted they passed it to the regents and a, a faceless bureaucrat who is going to be the new commissioner he or she of education the governor has said, when I alluded to uh, how they're going to evaluate uh, teachers, that of these tests, the Commissioner King, who just left, 70% of the kids were going to fail. He said that outright. First of all, why would you give a test that 70% of the kids are going to fail? Then the governor doubled down on testing and said, okay, but we're going to use those tests as a 50% barometer and indicator to evaluate educators' effectiveness. Makes absolutely no sense, which I can tell you right now, kids are going to fail because the comprehensive questions are way above their level and uh, teachers are not going to be effective they're going to be penalized for that if we file that what my colleagues did is beat their chest and said we're not going to let them do that but we're going to let the regents who are, are just the surrogates for the governor uh, elect the commissioner and he's going to follow or she's going to follow through and do 50 percent uh, common core was top down one size fits all no voices no discussion by parents using uh, standardized tests to an overwhelming level 
almost twice as much as taking the law boards, our kids are going to be testing. 150,000 parents stood up with cur courage courageously and said, my kids are not going to take these tests. Last week for English, th this week for math, only 60,000 did it last year. And we're not saying we don't like standards or heightened standards or heightened curriculum. Overutilization of standardized tests that are, are not developmentally appropriate. That's what needs to be adjusted in this. And uh, as you know, and I think you have a clip of that, I challenged the governor oh, you did. Uh, to come in because you have to read these tests. And once you read these tests, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade tests, you're going to start scratching your head and say, I don't know if I can get a 60 or 70 on this particular test. Oh, you did. You challenged the governor. He, this is a classic example of throwing down a gauntlet to, uh, here, folks. We'll show you exactly what Jim Tedisco said on the floor of the assembly and his challenge to Governor Andrew Cuomo. I hope the governor is listening and he's watching because uh, I have a message for him. And the message for Governor Cuomo is this. A large portion of the people in this state, and I think people from both sides of the aisle here, feel that through your actions and what you've illustrated, you think the three parts of government in New York State and in our Constitution for you are me, myself, and I. And if you think, Governor, if you're listening, i got a challenge for you. If you think the holy grail of improving our education is common core testing, i got a challenge. I want you to sit in the red room. I'll bring in the fifth grade common core math test, the fifth grade common core English test, and then we'll evaluate what your scores are and we'll release them to the public. And I believe you won't prove you're smarter than a fifth grader when we're done. Now, the fact of the matter is, People have stood up here and said, this bill is progress. This bill is regress. The reason after I spoke twice I had to stand up is because people have stood up and said, the problem with our education system is bad teachers. That is absolutely not the problem with our educational system. 99 to 95% of our t educators are great. They're outstanding. They're working hard. They love what they do. I'll tell you what's wrong with our system. We took billions of dollars out of it five to six or seven years ago, and we're just starting to put that money back into the system. Secondarily, we have an antiquated uh, formula that only two guys in a closet understand and can explain. Antiquated to the extent that high need, low wealth districts get shafted every single year. Those are the impoverished districts with kids with special needs. The third part of that formula, which we, we're not adjusting, is there's no, there's no autonomy in it. We got suburban schools, we have rural schools, we have urban schools, but we have a one-size-fits-all formula. We need to allow superintendents, administrators, school boards to use the funding the way they know best and provide them more autonomy, not fit them into the same niches. Yeah. We talk about uh, $23 billion in this budget totally for education. We closed the gap, GEA gap. That's the money I t t talked about that they took away. 1.6 billion, but even in that, giving that 1.6 billion back of the 670 schools, 200 of those schools got less than 40 percent. Now this was 60 percent of all the money, the gap that we, the court said we have to get, give back. I got a, a call from Galway, one of my schools in the 112th Assembly District. I said, Jim, I got 38 percent of my gap money back, but they said they gave 60 percent of that back across the state. Am I going to get my other 62 percent back next year? I said, I can't tell you that because the parity and the formula is not fair. And that's the discussion I was trying to have on the floor to let them know we have a lot to adjust, but most especially, all the money that's going to be spent is going to be spent to buy computers, to evaluate this common core testing for this software, and that comes from corporations like Mr. Gates and uh, the co the com Microsoft and the companies he runs. So if you follow the money, multinational, multi-billion dollar testing companies are the ones who are going to be making the money. Our schools should not be for sale, and we have to fight for them. In our last 10 seconds, have you gotten a phone call yet from the governor, maybe from the airplane on the way to Cuba, or while he's in Cuba, that he's taken the test yet? I haven't gotten a call, but I, I think he might try to send me a couple Cuban cigars, but I don't smoke anyway. So. Well, <laughs> then I guess we'll have to wait and see how that all plays out. The only way out. he can make up for me is to back off of this common cord and do it right. Jim Tedisco, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, folks, too. We'll hope to see you soon for our next edition of Assembly Calendar.